Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, good morning. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Chris Rosbach, who is here from um, UT Austin. Um, interviewing with us, um, and he, I, I will say this, he's the first candidate we've had interview who's brought his guitar along with him. Um, <laughs> he has a gig on Friday, um, but so I suppose yes. if somebody really wanted you, if things you, go you really badly, I'll just, <laughs> <laughs> I can always play a song. All right, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, in fact, <laughs> So uh, it really is great to have him here, and I'll let him get into his talk. All right, great. So uh, good morning. Thanks for coming. And uh, clearly, I'm uh, going to try to uh, spend some time talking to you about how we can make concurrency more accessible through better abstractions. So the motivation for this talk, and in fact, for most of my research, is an abiding interest in concurrency, and particularly in finding abstractions and mechanisms that can make it easier to manage and exploit concurrency. And I think this is a, an urgent problem currently because we're in a position where parallelism is really the only way forward in terms of performance. So we see this in a, in a couple of domains. Chip manufacturers have stopped scaling things like clock frequency and process as a way of improving single-threaded performance and have shifted the burden onto the shoulders of the programmers by starting to scale the number of cores on a chip. And we see also a, you know, a proliferation of massively parallel hardware in the, in the form of GPUs or graphics processing units. And I think while there has been you know, a trend where parallel hardware is increasingly abundant, tools that make it easy to program that hardware have not really enjoyed the same rate of growth. Okay? And particularly in the, in the CPU programming world, locks and threads remain the state of the art despite a long list of really well-lamented issues like deadlock, live lock, and so on. And while GPU-based programming has also seen a lot of big leaps forward as we've seen new uh, parallelization frameworks like CUDA and OpenCL come around. At the end of the day, programming these devices is still something of a black art that requires systems level knowledge of the device. And so I put it to you that better programming tools are urgently needed. And at the heart of the task of finding better programming tools is deciding what abstractions those tools are going to support. And I think choosing the right abstractions for concurrency can impact a lot of different uh, levels of the technology stack. My interest uh, focuses on operating systems and architectural support, and particularly on the interaction of the two. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about two seemingly separate areas. I'm going to be talking about transactional memory support in the, in the OS, and on, I'm going to talk about my new preliminary work on GPU support in the OS. And the high-level theme here is, is we're looking at places where the operating system and the hardware can collaborate to provide better abstractions to make it easy to get at the concurrency that these devices enable. OK, so brief outline for the rest of the talk. I'm going to spend the first bulk of the talk talking about transactional memory. I'll move on, talk about OS support for GPUs, touch briefly on future work, and conclude. OK, so let me posit for your consideration that programming with locks is still very much a necessary evil. And why is it evil? Well, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Say, sorry? I said you probably don't really need to tell us, but you can't. Probably don't need to tell you. So I will briefly uh, breeze through this, this, uh, th these points. They, uh, they deadlock, they live lock, they compose poorly. <laughs> they have poor uh, complexity and performance trade offs, and, and ultimately it's just hard to get right. Now, ostensibly, transactions, and particularly as supported by transactional memory, are, are free of these problems. And as a sort of a more concrete, illustration of what we'd like to be able to do with transactional memory. This is a 50-line comment from the Linux 2.6 uh, memory manager's filemap.c. And this describes the lock ordering discipline for the locks in that file. So if you're going to write code in this file or alter the code, you need to understand this. And, and I, you know, I submit to you that this is, this is a lot of complexity. What we'd like to be able to do with TM after we make it shimmer and shake <laughs> is, is sweep all this complexity away. All right. So I'm going to devote two slides to background on transactional memory for those who 
do not uh, spend a lot of time thinking about it or don't spend as much time as I spend thinking about it. And there are a few key ideas and key abstractions you need to understand. And the key idea, the key idea really, is that critical sections are going to execute speculatively and concurrently. So this is in strict contrast to locks, which enforce mutual exclusion and cause critical sections to serialize. What we want to be able to do with transactional memory is say, hey, everybody go for it. If a, if a sharing pattern occurs that violates correctness or endangers correctness, we'll detect that uh, dynamically using the TM hardware and use checkpoint and rollback mechanisms to retry until we know we can get a, a correct answer. Now, the abstractions that you need to support this, there are uh, really, I'm showing you six primitives here. The ones in blue are ones that you can expect in any transactional memory implementation, primitives to begin, end, and retry transactions. The ones in red are, are machine level instructions that I'm going to convince you hopefully in the next several slides are additional primitives you need if you're going to support transactional memory in an operating system. Now, a conflict, and, and I'll define them in greater detail subsequently as well. <laughs> you just need red instructions. Um, a conflict between two transactions occurs when there's a non-null intersection between the right set of one and the read and write set of another. So more informally, if two transactions access the same datum and at least one is a write, you have a conflict, at which point you will invoke this thing called a contention manager, which uh, comes in and, and enforces some, hopefully, performance-preserving policy about which transactions need to restart and which can continue to execute. And there's been a, a big body of research that has shown we need flexible policy in this area in order to uh, improve performance. So that was uh, kind of the, you know, the, the verbose take on it. Here's a more visual take. And I'm going to show you how hardware transactional memory can, uh, can, uh, can allow two critical sections to execute concurrently on CPU 0 and CPU 1. These, uh, these CPUs are simplified, so they have a, a program counter and a read and write set. And what we see is that as these CPUs step into the critical section and begin reading variables, the variables appear in the read set that is maintained on the processor. Now when we get to line 3 and CPU 0 reads C but CPU 1 writes it, at this point we have a conflict under the definition on the previous slide. So we'll invoke the contention manager which comes in and makes a decision about which of these CPUs gets to continue executing and which has to roll back. So for the sake of the argument, let's say that the contention manager decided in favor of CPU 1. This means that CPU 0 has to roll back and its uh, read and write set are cleared, CPU 1 gets to commit and continue. And by the way, I do encourage you to stop me and ask questions, because I, I suspect that you don't need a lot of encouragement on this front. But <laughs> So I also want to stop and uh, <laughs> what, what? Go back to the previous slide. Sure. In, in, in this case, if, if 7 was empty in there, you'd have a conflict by your definition that either serialization would be correct. Right? If seven was empty. If, seven, if there's nothing in line seven there, if you just did the read or write and then you did X N. Uh, if it, oh, it, so what you're suggesting is that there is there. actually an ordering which would yield the right answer in this case. Well, I'm suggesting that at any any of the orderings that you could come up with for those things produces a serializable result for that particular. Well, in, in other words, it's not really a conflict. Well, actually, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, buy that. I think I think it's a conflict. I think it's a conflict, depending on what order you commit these these transactions in. So the order, I, right? So, well, because it might be if you can serialize all of the writes of one after all of the reads of another, you do get a correct result regardless, right? So, are you asking about if we leave this interleaving without serializing these critical sections, well, what, or are you? What I'm saying is that. Yeah. The only thing, that, the only interaction between those two is in C, right? Yes. A, a and B are read only. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I posited that. Ah, uh, uh, okay. So you're talking about a blind. blind so, right, so what I'm saying is, yes, that, is that no matter what you do with this, you, if you actually, it's there's no real conflict. Yes, I, 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 I agree. Example. Because there's a blind right in one of these. Yes, I, I because totally there's agree. a blind right. Yes. So that's kind of an artifact of a simplified. Uh, yeah, example. You asked, you but, no, no, you, you asked. asked and, <laughs> and I concede that you're right. <laughs> and so, you know, I should probably, uh, it would be probably a good idea to insert a read of C here in both. And then that would get rid of the problem you're so talking the, about. The bigger question, the more interesting question is um, does this kind of thing happen in practice? Is the, is the definition that, that you're using um, actually 
generating conflicts in practice that that aren't really necessary. Yeah. So so abs so the answer is absolutely, and you know, I really wish that I had chosen to talk about a different paper because that would be a perfect, <laughs> a perfect well, setup. Okay. We have an hour this afternoon. We have, we have talk about okay. it then. So so yeah. It happens, it, it's really workload dependent. So there are a lot of sharing patterns where essentially anytime you have variables that are, uh, have a lot of right sharing, like counters, this definition is too conservative. It's definitely possible that the interleaving that you execute that has a conflict under this definition can still produce the correct result. Okay? And it's possible also to use uh, a technique that, that, that I call dependence awareness that allows you to essentially keep speculating in the presence of that kind of conflict and then sort it out at a later time. Did this actually, you know, was it safe to, use, to, to tolerate this conflict? And if so, then commit, and otherwise, then, then, then uh, roll back. And in some cases, if you have things like shared counters in, in, in uh, environments where, like, you know, garbage collection, a lot of statistics, linked lists have these kinds of patterns, if your workload features a lot of that, you can get significant speed ups. And what we found is that in two of the stamp benchmarks, we got speed ups of up to 30%. However, in a lot of cases, you don't. You know, if you don't have blind rights, if you don't have things that are essentially you know, single points of right sharing, then you wind up investing a lot of complexity in accelerating that particular scenario. Yeah. Great question, though. <laughs> okay, so up until this year, <clears throat> it has been sort of de rigueur at a TM talk to say, well, this is free of live lock and deadlock, therefore it's easier and we need it and you know, everybody should build it. And I can claim to have benefited actually from that <laughs> blind acceptance of that dogma, but I do want to you know, dedicate a, a slide to, to talking about a, a paper I had in this year's PPOP where we actually questioned this assumption and, and tried to bring some empirical evidence to, you know, to bear on the, on the problem. And what we did was we took five semesters worth of UT's OS undergrad students and had them write the same programs using locks, both fine and coarse grain, condition variables or monitors, and, and transactional memory. And essentially you know, what we did is say, okay, you're going to write the same programs nine different times and you know, we're going to control, control the order in which you write them so that we can normalize for experience and what you learned in the last case and and we surveyed them afterwards and said well you know was it easier and then I read all their code and classified the synchronization errors and what we found yeah that was a good time <laughs> <laughs> what we found is that you know the survey you know the, the, there were 36 questions in the survey and so this is maybe a little bit unfair to try to condense it into a single uh, partial order but ultimately this is this is kind of the takeaway if we asked them did you find it easier we didn't really get the stark, uh, you know, flag-waving support we, we might have hoped for. What, the, what we found was that coarse grain locks were actually the easiest to use. Condition variables, nobody liked them. No one could get them right. And there was kind of a tie between <coughs> fine grain locks and TM. However, there was a very different story that was revealed if we go and, and look at the synchronization error rates across all 1,300 programs. A and what I found is that if you know, for all the programs that use coarse grain locks, 27% had at least one synchronization error. A whopping 62% had errors for fine grain locks, which might be kind of an indictment of our pedagogy, but this is in fact what we found. And then TM had error rates on, on average of less than 10%. So, you know, what, what I think this is ultimately saying is that if your goal is to write correct programs, which I hope it is, uh, TM is in fact easier. And with that, I'm going to move on and talk about uh, TM support in the OS. And what I believe is that the operating system really is the killer application for transactional memory. And the, you know, among the reasons I believe this is that operating systems are among the most complex parallel programs around. And they can really benefit from simplification, both in terms of reducing the number of locks and getting rid of uh, you know, lock ordering disciplines. We need our operating systems to be correct, right? And hopefully I've given you some, some reason to believe that we can get things correct more easily with, with TM. And of course, we need our operating systems to be fast. And by using optimistic concurrency, there's a good reason to believe we can get better performance. A lot of applications spend a lot of time in the kernel. If we can make the kernel faster, everybody, everybody benefits. So you should 
use TM in an operating system. And the question remains how to go about it. And we, uh, when we started looking at this problem, sort of the conventional wisdom about how to take a lock-based program and use transactions in it is you find some polling primitive, like spin locks, and you map acquires and releases to transaction begins and transaction ends. And this is, in fact, exactly what we did when we first started trying to use transactions in Linux 2.6. We uh, posited this primitive called an X-spin lock, which essentially um, changed the implementation of spin lock and spin unlock to do exactly what I'm showing you up here. And we were able to change nine subsystems in Linux this way, which amounted to about 30% of the dynamic lock calls over the workloads we looked at. And it took six of us a year to do this, which is, uh, you know, it was kind of a long and, and painful year. So why, why did it take us this long? Well, we ran into problems that we didn't, you know, some of them we might ought to have foreseen, some we did not. I.O. is a big one. We, of course, want to be able to do I.O. in an operating system. It's kind of important. And it's well known that you know, I.O. is not always a good fit for transactions. Also, idiosyncratic locking. So we saw a lot of, lot of cases where you know, people were kind of creative with how they used locks. A great example is the uh, spin lock that protects the scheduler's run queue in Linux 2.6.16 is acquired in one process context and released in another on a context switch, which is kind of a tweaky place to use a transaction. So what this eventually led us to is the conclusion that if you're going to use transactions, locks and transactions need to be able to cooperate. And there's other great arguments for this. There's a vast body of lock-based code out there that you don't want to have to throw away just because you've drunk the transactional Kool-Aid and have decided you want to, you know, yes? Are you using the argument about that you haven't just vastly increased the complexity of the operating system? You now have not only different types of locking disciplines, but you have transactional memory discipline as well that you have to incorporate. You have to reason about those together rather than saying, look, if, if right. transactional memory is safer and easier mm -hmm. to reason about, then we should use it. Sure. Um, so I'm tempted, to, I'm tempted to respond to that as if you know what's in the coming slides. Is that true? <laughs> no. OK. Maybe you should hold off, to that, hold off on that question, because if, if you're making the point that by adding yet another synchronization technique, we've kind of increased the diversity in the ecosystem in a way that is likely to imp you know, increase complexity, that's one thing. In the coming slides, you're going to be even more convinced <laughs> of that. Okay. And I want to wait until, until you've seen that before I answer that question. question yeah. Which I'm actually literally not allowed to read. Um, because we, well, that's not quite true, but it's close. <laughs> um, I, I suppose I haven't read it. Okay. You're allowed to do I.O. operations while you're holding spin locks in Linux? Yes. Yes. Okay. And you can take page faults while you're holding spin locks in Linux? Yes. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's very foreign to the way Windows works. Um, because, well, I'm can't. not going to discuss yeah. Linux design now, but I just wanted to clarify that because it seems yeah. Cool. And you can conditionally do I.O. with a spin lock held, which is even even weirder and essentially is you know what this point is about. So you, still you know, so just because you've acquired a spin lock and you're gonna release it in that critical section, you might not always do the I.O. in the critical section. It might be something oh, of the form. If if some condition do the I.O. otherwise don't, right? Right. Yeah. And so I mean ultimately you know, what I'm getting at with this argument so is the idea that, well, if you, why do you need a special tool to handle I.O., Chris? Why can't you just look at the critical sections and say, oh, well, this one does I.O., this one does not. Use a lock where there's I.O., and, and you can't because there's conditional, conditional I.O., things nest at, at, at very deep levels, and you can take page faults. It's like a small step after spinning while block on I.O., but okay. So kind of to, to a related question to Bill's, so Linux, Kernel memory is not paged, is that correct? Uh, I believe that is correct. Okay, so they're less likely to have yeah. this problem, but they could, for instance, take a spin lock and block a copy in. Yeah. So, they never do. I don't know. I the, uh, yeah, they do. <laughs> 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 uh, and you know, finally, the last, last argument for this really is that you know, transactions perform well when, I mean, the whole idea here is if the, the common case is no contention, that's where we're going to get our performance benefits. That's when you want programmers to use this primitive. Uh, if there is contention, locks might be a better fit, and we want people to have 
still the ability to, to choose the right primitive for the right environment. And the abstraction that we eventually chose to address this situation is called the CX spin lock, which stands for Cooperative Transactional Spin Lock. And the idea is that we're going to dynamically choose between a lock or a transaction depending on you know, what's going on in the system. So most critical sections will optimistically try to execute a transaction. And if the hardware detects an I.O. attempt, I mean, it's hardware, right? You can, you can definitely see the I.O. happening there if you can't see it anyplace else. If, if, the, if the I.O. attempt is detected, we're going to roll back and acquire a lock. And the, the trick here is involving the contention manager in the, uh, in the lock acquisition, because what this does introduce is the need to be able to serialize transactional execution against lock-based execution. And this is what we need these in additional instructions for that I, I showed you in the previous slide. We need an X-test, which is a transactional version of a test instruction, X-CAS, transactional version of a compare and swap. You know, and those of you who've spent a lot of time looking at spin lock implementations will recognize these as the basic building blocks of, of a spin lock. And then this extra instruction called xget txid, which allows uh, a CPU to query, or a thread to query for the existence of an active transaction on that CPU. And then the final addition is we're going to say, let this x begin instruction return a reason for the retry, so that if it rolls back because it detected I.O., we get a return code that says I.O. occurred, and then we can you know, decide what to do on the rollback from there. One nice thing about using uh, CX spin locks instead of bare transactions is that using preprocessor magic we were able to convert the entire kernel in a month with this abstraction instead of, uh, yes? What do you classify as I.O.? I mean, so, it, so this is a, a CPU level, right? Yes. So in, out, in and out, and writes to memory that right, are the DMA. On, on the hardware surfaces. OK. <clears throat> so this is the CX spin lock API. It consists of uh, three functions. The first is a CX optimistic, and this is the version that is going to optimistically attempt a transaction. And what it will do is if the xbegin returns this flag that says we need, we need mutual exclusion to execute this uh, critical section, then it will use the CX exclusive API to try to get a lock on the critical section instead. Now, the CX exclusive, as I've said, acquires a lock, but it's going to use this transactional CAS instruction, which makes the writes and reads that it does to a lock variable visible to the, the transactional subsystem. And then the last one is CXN, which releases a critical section, whether it's protected by a transaction or by a lock. So this is where we use that exit TXID instruction. If we're in a transaction, end it. Otherwise, write the lock variable to release it. So I want to show you how we can use this primitive to serialize access to a critical section between transactional execution and lock-based execution. So CPU 0 on the left is going to try to use CX optimistic to enter in the transaction. CPU 1 is going to use CX exclusive. And initially, we have a lock, which in Linux parlance has a value of 1. That means it's unlocked. Okay. So in the interleaving, we're going to consider CPU 0 enters and starts a transaction. This is reflected by a new TXID of 1 on the processor. A TXID of 0, by the way, means no active transaction. Now, that's, of course, relevant when we watch what CPU 1 does. It's going to execute this exit TXID instructions, which says, oh, I don't have an active transaction, so I'm going to come down into this while loop where I'm going to start spinning and trying to use a transactional CAS to acquire the lock. Now, because no I.O. has occurred, the status check for exclusivity here fails in CX optimistic, and we come down and use this X test instruction to read the value of the lock variable. Now, X test has the same semantics as test. It succeeds if the, the value in the lock matches, the, matches the, the other parameter. But it has the additional semantics that if it succeeds, that variable is entered into the read set in the, for that, that CPU's transactions. Now, what this enables is that when CPU 1 subsequently goes and tries to write the lock variable in a transaction, you can think of X CAS as essentially a mini transaction, a one, one instruction long transaction. This makes its writes visible, and we have a read-write conflict under the definition that we've been considering in this talk. And this allows us to invoke the contention manager, which can then arbitrate and decide who gets to, who gets to keep going. So let's assume that the contention manager decides uh, CPU 1 wins. This means that CPU 0 rolls all the way back to its X begin and keeps retrying. The X CAS instruction succeeds, and the lock variable gets written and is now, now locked. And you can see that the, the test instruction down here Will, will subsequently fail until 
we're out of the critical section under so lock based execution. One is not in the transaction. That's right. That's exactly the. So that. It, it has to win. <laughs> no, it doesn't. How would it hold back? Well, <laughs> let me show you. <laughs> If, in fact, it doesn't have to roll back. So, oh, just essentially, yeah. Like, like So if the contention manager decides, you know what, CPU 0 wins, we fail the XCAS instruction. Okay. And then this guy enters a, a spin loop that looks a lot like a TTAS loop and winds up waiting. Yeah, XTAS. How is that any different from a read in this case? Because it, oh, you said it's like a read, but it puts it in the read set. Those oh, well, so if we did not have, we can also use it without outside of the transaction. Uh, OK. In this okay. example, you and the other, the, well, the, but the more important part is that if it fails, it doesn't enter it in the read set, right? Oh, okay. So if 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 this failed and we entered it in the read set, then it would always this guy would work. always have a conflict and we right. would wind up now burning getting, a whole bunch of. Makes effort. much more sense that way. Okay. Great. Any more CX spin lock questions? No, no. Going once, going oh, okay, gone. <laughs> OK, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, our evaluation of TX Linux. So we, uh, we started with a meta TM, which is our hardware transactional memory uh, implementation, which essentially extends x86 instruction set with these instructions that I've been, been talking about. There was a paper about meta TM in ISCA 2007. We used Simix simulation environment with these hopefully convincing machine parameters, 16 and 32 CPUs. And the benchmarks we looked at were Parallel Make, Bonnie++, which is a file system stress test, Modified Andrew Benchmark, Parallel Configure, Parallel Find. Now, the thing I want to stress about these is that they're user mode benchmarks. They do not use transactions directly, right? They're exercising the kernel, which is using transactions internally for its own synchronization. And what we found in our initial work, starting with, uh, with 2616, is that, uh, oh, also recall, we, we, you know, we sort of went through this exercise twice, right? The X spin lock version was using bare transactions, and then we have a CX spin lock conversion where we actually converted all the subsystems to use transactions. So the X spin lock's only part of the kernel's converted. Right, exactly. So there's nine, nine subsystems, all the highest contending subsystems. And then here, absolutely every spin lock in the kernel is converted. And what we found is that with 16 CPUs, we had a 2% slowdown and a 2% speed up on 32 with the X spin locks. And then using CX spin locks, we had 2.5% and 1% speed up on 16 and 32. Uh, spin locks, I mean, I guess this is an assumption. Are spin locks the main lock that you're using in Linux, or are there other kinds of locks in Linux? They're certainly, uh, in terms of the, they vastly outnumber others. But I mean, how, you know, what does main really mean, right? So there are, so there are other locking primitives in it. Oh, yeah. There's, Nine or, nine or ten of them. Mutexes, semaphores, uh, read copy update, uh, sequence locks. I mean, it's definitely. Touching, and you're not touching any of those this way. Uh, well, so any of them that are built on spin locks, we do touch. Okay, so um, reader writer spin locks. Um, there are spin locks used in RCU. There are spin locks used in sequence locks. We do not touch mutexes and semaphores because those are blocking, right? So. Transactions, let me emphasize, you don't want to block. I mean, you, you, you can argue that there are ways to do it. And in our ASPLOS paper in 2009, we came up with a transactional variant on a mutex. I'm not sure whether I believe <laughs> you want to block. Even after, I mean, great, we got a paper. You know, that's great. But, you know, I, I think you. <laughs> anyway, the point of all, yeah. So, um, uh, are you ready to come back to Ed's question yet? Or can you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And thank you. I completely got, got up ahead of steam and forgot. So, so the question is, isn't, you know, not, not just is this introducing another primitive, making the world more complex. Suddenly, I'm telling you, well, we want to get rid of locks because of lock ordering and deadlock and so on. And yet, now you're telling me that your transactions are going to roll back and get a lock, right? And so isn't that the worst of both worlds? And you know, the answer is, is no. And the reason is that you can re drastically reduce the number of locks with this, even if you still have to use lock ordering for things that, that might do I.O. So an example of how you might do this is you might take every critical section in the kernel that, does, that conditionally does I.O. and map it to one lock. So you get rid of, you know, I think our estimates at the time were... So Yes, exactly. Coarser locking. And also, you can separate the, you can, 
Under the current regime, a lock is really tightly coupled with the data structure it protects, right? And this is, this, this makes sense with locks, right? With trans, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> however, you don't need this with transactions, right? Because you're speculating. And particularly if you, you know, if it's not the common case that you need to roll back and acquire a lock, it's totally acceptable to, to share a lock among data structures that might not be related. BKL softened with the... Uh, effectively, <laughs> effectively, except, you know, the problem with BKL is that it's highly contended, right? Sure. So we don't want to return to, like, one highly contended well, lock that can, that can, you know, so cause even more... Simply, do. Wait, you said, you said we're, we're moving to a coarser direction. That's the benefit mm -hmm. is we can afford coarser locks, but not that course? Is that the... Where's the sweet spot? Then? Um, that course, but maybe not that lock. That lock is, is highly contended. So what you really want to do is find critical sections that conditionally do I.O. and map all of those to one course lock, right? What you don't want to do is take a lot. Hmm? Aren't those the ones that you're likely to be in longest and hence the ones most likely to be contended because I was slow? I mean, unless I guess conditionally means almost never. I mean, that, 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 that really is the point, right? It really is that true. I, don't I mean, if, if in fact you're always, if the common case is that you are going to do I.O. and roll back, you're essentially, it's a waste. It's not just <laughs> it's not that you just don't get the performance benefits. You actually make things worse because you're going to speculate. Take fine grain locks and turn them into coarse grain locks that are contended, right? Which is worse. No. no, I'm saying take fine grain locks and turn them into coarse grain locks that are not contended. Okay, so. So how are they not contended? Okay. I mean, unless the answer consider, is consider consider the following. Up. So uh, Sorry, we have a, a critical I'm section. I'm just checking. That does. Uh, Let's just broadly call read and write sharing. Let's just have an instruction share, yeah, okay. okay? A, and then uh, you know, if maybe, <laughs> do some I/O, okay? All right. And then we have another one, which you know, I'll let you kind of fill in. Shares something else, completely unrelated. Checks some other condition. If uh, maybe two, you know, do some other I/O. And the point here is that in, this, in the common case, we don't have contention because we're using the same lock variable to synchronize disjoint data structures. So in the common case, you get no conflict. Of course, you only want to do this if it's also the common case that maybe and maybe two are not, not true, OK? Right. So, I'm at, so how often are, I, I don't have any sense for how often conditional I.O. in locks and Linux happens. So I mean, really, literally not. Yeah, so it's, uh, I don't believe I have the number, like, I, I mean, in, intuitively, I want to tell you that it's between 50 and 70% of the time for some locks, but it depends which lock, right? It depends which, which lock, which data structure. So you do, it's not, you, you do lose the, the property that you can go and say, you can blindly choose the primitive. You do need to understand the IO profile of the, of the critical section that you're doing this with. I misunderstand what you're doing, but what I thought you said was that roughly you're going to take anything that, that does this conditional I.O., and if it's actually doing the conditional I.O., you're going to fall back on one big block. That's right. The memory axis is deflated. Only if the memory axis is so, so if one hits A and one hits C, right. so they're not going to conflict most no. times, so you won't grab the coarse grain block. Right. The, common, the common case is because these, these can, so I used to have. No, no, no. no. No, I don't get it. You, you, always, you always have to grab the lock if you're doing it. You, you always have to if you're going right. to do it. If you're I, actually going to do it. But if the common yeah. case is that you don't. Yes. And you're using, you know, and you don't touch the same memory, you've essentially created a situation where you don't need as many lock variables. Sure. If you, if you don't do the I.O. and you don't touch the same memory, then you clearly win. Yes. But I thought you just told me that 50 to 75 percent of the time you do do the I.O. Right. So. so it just like what I'm telling you, I guess, is that it depends on the profile of the, lock, of the particular lock. Of the lock. Some things do I/O rarely. Some things do I/O most of the time. So you have to go into it. That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. We do need to go and understand the profile. Nothing system. is free. Okay. No, nothing is free, unfortunately. Yeah. So this you can course in the locks that you use once you have transactions. Have you actually done that, or do you just keep them? Okay. Um, yes. So, 
but we did do, you know, so, you know, what I wanted to say in that last slide is I wasn't expecting anyone to, you know, cheer my 2.5% speed ups. And what I really didn't want people to come away from this talk with was the idea that, in fact, we, you know, the, the performance benefits of TM were, were not extant. And so we did repeat this exercise with Linux 2.4 uh, for ASPLOS uh, last year. And what I'm showing you here is a snapshot from this paper. Um, and the reason I moved on to this is, of course, because 2.4 has the big kernel lock, much coarser grain synchronization. And what we were able to do is go and essentially replace coarser synchronization with transactions. And what I'm showing is the scalability. The top line is 2.6 unmodified. Bottom line is 2.4 unmodified. And the middle is, is uh, TX Linux 2.4, where we're transactionalizing not just spin locks, but also mutexes. CX mutex is the, the new primitive in that paper. And what we find is that if there actually is synchronization overhead to eliminate, we can eliminate it. And we're able to make up a significant fraction of the, the performance benefits that took kernel developers years to achieve in the 2.4 to 2.6 transition, yes. In the 2.4 case, do you follow what you've been saying and actually place them with fewer first grade locks? Or are you, I mean, I know there were already fewer first grade locks. No, we did, we, did not, we did not rewrite significant sections of the It would just be interesting to see what happened if you just created totally three locks, be, yes. threw them in the kernel and said, well, be, look at all that performance gains. Yes, I mean, you know, ultimately, you know, one thing that I would really, you know, like I said at the beginning, I think that this, you know, no matter where you come down on this, you know, TM hype that we've enjoyed over the last four or five years, or not enjoyed, <laughs> I do believe that, that the operating system is the only place that is likely to really be able to use a hardware-based primitive like this. And I would love to see, or do, some work where we actually were able to go and restructure significant portions of it to take advantage of that. And that's something that, like, you know, me and my cube at UT, having already sort of demonstrated you know, the, the idea doesn't make sense to do. It might make more sense to do it here. Yes? So I'm really surprised that the map doesn't speed up. As you, I mean, right, the 2.4 shows nothing, and you're getting at 2x. Because the file systems community has largely abandoned it because we all decided that essentially it's just measuring the compiler running, mm -hmm. which isn't a very great file system benchmark, but it ought to parallelize wonderfully. So, do you have an intuition for why it's so cruddy? Why it's so cruddy? Oh, like why, why in general does the benchmark not, why it's not, not look like this? Much closer to one-to-one -one speed up. Yeah. It's, not okay. a it's not doing the parallel thing, is it? So why would it parallelize? Yeah. Oh, maybe that's it. It depends, on, your, it depends on, on, I mean, when well, we ran it, it did parallel make because the our build tools. They're not multiple, they're multiple. You're, oh, asking, you're, running, you're running, actually running this entire separate benchmark. Are you running separate? 32 instances of the end of benchmark? No, no, no. How does it parallelize? I mean, what do you parallelize? So, That's a good question. Okay, now I understand why it's not speed up. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're only using one processor. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll talk about later. Okay. Yeah, so okay. guess why it speeds up at all. <laughs> the, you know, the, the, the real reason we get any, probably any, the reason we can see this much is that in a simulation environment we can make disk latency zero. That's, yeah. All right. So at this point, I want to spend just a little more time talking about uh, transactional memory, and I want to talk about how we can use it to eliminate priority inversion. Now, in this audience, I probably don't need to spend a lot of time coming up with background on, on, on priority inversion, so I'm going to kind of skip through this slide. Essentially, we, you know, it occurs if, uh, if we have some sharing, we have a higher priority process. Uh, sharing a resource with a low priority process, we wind up with the high priority process descheduled. It's a drag if we get a... <laughs> We get a medium priority process coming in and doing totally unrelated work. Everybody winds up asleep, and then there's, of course, the, the additional watchdog timer kind of problem that can come in and say, oh, is nobody making any progress? Reset the system at, at times when you don't want it. And this is a real and expensive problem. Sorry to <laughs> put you through this, uh, this slide, but I've got to get through it. Uh, this happened with Mars Pathfinder in 97. Fortunately, they found it before they launched it, so they got to keep their 150 million dollars, but the, the, the real point here is that uh, existing solutions such as priority inheritance are fundamentally band-aids because they do not make the problem go away. All they do is pro, uh, enforce an upper bound on how much time you can spend executing under priority inversion. Now, <clears throat> here's what I really wanted to get to, which is there's uh, this dogma that TM gets rid of all the problems of locks. Priority inversion is not one of those problems that it makes go away. Okay? 
In fact, priority inversion can happen with transactions, and it boils down to the policy that the contention manager chooses. And so to convince you of this, I'm essentially showing you the same, same scenario that I showed you in the previous slide, where we have a low priority process that is older, um, having a conflict uh, with a higher priority process that is younger. Now, the, one of the findings of, of the body of research on contention management in transactional memory is that you want the older transaction to win. This is, this is a nice thing because it usually provides good performance, and it's also free of live lock for obvious reasons. It imposes a, you know, a, a total order. Unfortunately, in this case, it causes, causes priority inversion. And in fact, what we, yes? Like the obvious strategy, if you want to like, very, or, tell, tell me why this thing is. What I think about to say is naive. Why not have your sorting order be major sort on the priority and the minor sort on the age? <clears throat> that is exactly what what we're getting to. But before we did this work, no one had thought of this. <laughs> I mean, it's just profoundly <laughs> obvious, right? <laughs> I mean, I remember walking into my advisor's office and saying, we, "This is so obvious, we can't publish this, right?" Like. <laughs> But no one else did. Just win. <laughs> you still can. So in fact, we could, and we did. Okay. But but absolutely, you, you've jumped straight to the the punchline, which I will show you after convincing you that it, this actually does happen in our benchmarks and uh, you know across all the uh, benchmarks we looked at, almost 10% you know had this problem, and the way we solved it was by providing a register that is writable in kernel mode only that the OS can use to say this you know this current thread has. This priority, and that way, when the, the hardware that actually decides arbitrates a conflict gets invoked, it can say, "Okay, higher priority process wins," unless we've got a tie, in which case we're going to default to some other live lock free policy like timestamp. And what this you know, what this does in our benchmarks is eliminate 100% of the priority inversion. Now, the reason I have the caveat in our benchmarks is that um, because the priority that the hardware uses is a snapshot at the time. The transaction begins. We essentially provide an instruction that says, you know, write the write the priority here, and then start speculating. It's totally possible that the kernel can change the dynamic priority while we're in a transaction. So it's truth in advertising. You know, it is possible that, tri that priority inversion can still occur, but we didn't see it. And negligible performance cost, which is great. <clears throat> so I want to uh, sort of briefly. Uh, wrap up the, uh, the basic lessons learned with TX Linux. Obviously, as I've just told you, priority inversion can be eliminated with TM. This is, this is a good thing, right? We want that. Locks and transactions need to be able to cooperate if you're going to use transactions in, in, a, in an operating system. I think this is true even if you're going to use transactions in a user mode program. Unfortunately, this new abstraction, the, the CX spin lock, makes it possible to, to do that and it makes it possible to handle I.O. sort of uh, more gracefully. Transactions can reduce synchronization overhead, but only if it's there to begin with. Now, these are the conclusions that you might see in a paper. I want to sort of step back and tell you what I actually really think you should take away from the TX Linux work. So most importantly, TX Linux, I think, remains the most realistic benchmark for transactional memory to date. So at the time we started this work, most TM research was based on micro benchmarks like RB trees, hash tables, splash two, things like this. And being able to actually go and, and apply this to a real system exposed a lot of myopic designs, both in terms of how people thought about how we should use transactions and in terms of what a transactional subsystem su should support. So for example, the contention management policies, there's papers about, hey, you know, here's my new whiz-bang policy that is a blend of these other policies and gives us speed ups under such and such conditions. Not one of them thought about you know, what, what, you know, integration with an operating system. Additionally, the, you know, we needed new primitives in, from the hardware to be able to use this in an OS that none of the existing designs thought about. And ultimately, you, know, you really need to be able to do research that crosses layers in the technology stack to come to these kinds of conclusions. So. <clears throat> I'm going to change channels here and start talking about my preliminary work, which is, shares the theme of OS abstractions, but is no longer going to be about transactional memory at all. <laughs> so I want to give you an opportunity, if you want to dig in about TM before I move on, this might be a more tasteful place for me to give you that opportunity. Okay, one, one more question. All right. So the designs I've seen for hardware 
ATM support tend to work by having sort of limited limited sets of you know, read and write sets, and then when they spill over, you fall back into some sort of horrible Michael Scott as this is our <laughs> uh, uh, software <laughs> transactional memory. Did your simulator consider that? Because it sounds like these Linux locks touch a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, <clears throat> great, great question. And our simulator does does handle this. So, you know, essentially what I had to do was there's a lot of different ways to build an HTM. One of them is to use the L1 cache as essentially your write buffer. So if you write write a line, you mark it in the cache, and that way when you abandon the speculation, you can just invalidate those lines. So that's the kind of design we looked at. Other approaches involve using store buffers, which is a smaller write set. But at the end of the day, you're limited by the size size of your cache to the number of writes and reads you can do. So in this system, I built a cache model that that essentially does exactly this and then asserts a line to the CPU when it when any line that has been touched transactionally falls out. So this can happen not just <clears throat> if you touch so much data that it doesn't fit in the cache. This can also happen when you have an associativity in eviction, you know. And yeah, we did, you know, all our all our experiments model this. And it's also a big motivation behind the CX spin lock. Right? Like if in fact the data that your transaction touches are, you know, are such that you can't actually make a transaction succeed because it's always going to have an associativity conflict or something like this. You need to be able to roll back and acquire a lock. Okay, so, so the way this works is you would, you would fall back and take a lock if you... Okay. Yes, one however... That's that better one actually than what Michael did. Well, um, I mean, <laughs> but, you know, in fairness, in the AS Plus paper, we, we also looked at other, other strategies like rolling, you know, defaulting to an STM. It turns out to be a nightmare. To get, to get right, <laughs> we looked at simplified strategies of, well, you know, can we do something like allow just one software transaction with any number of concurrent hardware transactions? And it turns out, yes, there are tricks you can play with per CPU variables and things like this and, you know, simple commit protocols that allow you to do this. But again, it, it kind of turns up to be a nightmare <laughs> to get right and doesn't always give you the performance benefits that you, that you want. Transactions aborted because of running out of cash lines. Depen it, uh, it really depends. So for the kernel benchmarks, it's very rare, three percent tops, because these are spin locks, right? Okay, so there, so uh, you know, in the especially like when you start with two six sixteen, the average size of a critical section is a hundred instructions. So you're almost never going to overflow L1 cache. When we got to two uh, two point four, where we're dealing with much bigger read write sets. Then we're looking at more in the you know five to ten percent range, and then the de facto standard for TM research user mode benchmarks. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Stamp. That's kind of what everybody uses, and that suite has a, has a whole range of profiles of critical section size. Some things are you know essentially designed to stress this this part of the design, and, and others are not. So. Yeah. So did you run you ran stamp on top of TO TX Linux? Yes. Not in the work I'm talking about here, but definitely like uh, in the micro paper where okay. we tried to use so you, so the you question you asked earlier about do all in you know, yes. So you had both user mode transactions have hybrid transactions have you use yes. both and and dealt with the yes. the conflicts that come out of that. Yeah, well I mean it's very rare for a, a user mode transaction to conflict with a kernel. I mean, you're not supposed to share that memory, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And additionally, I mean, so the only time you might actually have that kind of sharing is in a system call, like a copy to user or from. But a system call is effectively I.O. Right. So you don't, you don't cross system call boundary when you use my transaction, right? That's right. Because they don't oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So okay. it's, yes. I mean, unless you've got Don's, no, Don's stuff, you might try to, yeah. you might try to do that. <laughs> so in your performance numbers, did you measure, like, I, I guess, uh, any hardware uh, simulation would be kind of free or, or cost little, but how would you measure the performance of when you had to fall back on your software? Uh, Same way. So the I mean it's execution driven simulation. So you know so what, you actually you really yeah. measure absolutely. So I, I built a cache model that aborts a, trans, a hardware transaction in the simulator when it overflows, and then the operating system reacts by going back and acquiring. And you gave instead. it actually some reasonable. Uh, 
reasonable. Like, being, uh, like, like aboarding the cash, you know, you have. Yeah, yeah. well, so, okay. You know, add some, some cost to that. You, it it you do, all those flash clearing of bits, right? So to abort, you essentially need to make every line invalid, which winds up being a right to, to want. You can essentially flash clear. So you can do that in some very small number of cycles. That's not the main cost. The main cost is in the fact that you suddenly have a cache cold cache for everything that you've just <laughs> thrown away, which, by the way, turns out to be kind of a, a major neglected cost in using hardware transactions. Is yeah, that so you did include all that. So if I would oh, actually yeah. build a machine, it would probably perform the same. It's, I believe that, yes. Did yes. okay. you build oh, CPU? Pretty, hmm? The Cynix CPU is pretty, it's, it's in order, right? Yeah, no, we did not, we did not, we did not do out of order anything like that. But you beefed you beef up the cache well? Yeah. Okay. So I mean, I rewrote, you know, the, all right, let's okay. do the GPU stuff. Yeah, oh, okay. I have one more question. Yes. So, uh, apart from the priority inversion, it is the other preference problems, like in cases where you have oh, very heavy. All of that. Right. Not so much with contention, but more often in cases where the, the implicit, you know, I guess I, I want to say protocol, but you know, the, the way you're supposed to use the lock was not obvious to us until we, you know, broke it by using a transaction. So one, one great case is a sequence Sequence locks have this assumption that uh, they can actually do sharing on the same stack, but a reader always has to be higher on the stack than, the, than a writer or you deadlock. We didn't know that until we replaced it with, a, with something that could roll back and acquire a lock that caused the whole system to freeze. So, all right, so you'd, you'd like to hear about GPUs. Yeah. <clears throat> Which, hmm? Yeah. Today, you're gonna run out of time. I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going I'm to breeze through this then. <laughs> so, <clears throat> it's good that I can breeze through it because it's preliminary work. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the motivation for really this work is, is what I believe, in my experience of, of trying to leverage GPUs for, for certain workloads, is that, that poor OS level abstractions are what's limiting GPU applicability in, in certain application domains. So there are certain application domains where it's definitely a good fit. One of them, and most obvious, is graphics and gaming community, right? It better be... These people better have the right programming tools. The devices were built for that. And the tools these people have are things like shader languages, HLSL, graphics libraries like DirectX and OpenGL. And then there's this other community called the uh, GPGPU, general purpose GPU community. These people are largely focused on uh, parallelizing high latency scientific algorithms like protein folding. And there are some great tools for them like CUDA and OpenCL, which are user mode parallelization frameworks that provide a C-like interface. However, I believe that the application ecosystem is considerably more diverse than this, and what I'm going to try to convince you in the next few slides is that lack of good OS-level abstractions is what's kind of sequestering GPU usage into these kinds of these two domains. And to, to sort of focus the argument I'm making, I want to look at what, what I'm calling interactive applications. So examples of this are gestural interface, waving your hands at your computer, hoping for a result, brain-computer interface, which my advisor is a huge believer in. <laughs> by the way. He went and got one of these helmets. Spatial audio, real-time uh, image recognition. So what these share with the applications on the previous slide is a high level of data parallelism, making them a good fit for, for a GPU model of computation. What makes them different is that, you know, in most cases, they're fundamentally processing user input, which means that while they need concurrency to get good performance, they also need low latency. And because they're acting as a logical device, they need to be multiplexed by the OS across applications. And I want to focus in particular on the problem of gestural interface because I've spent a lot of time looking at this particular problem. Examples are, of course, Surface that you guys have. At a high level, I'm showing you, a, you know, in, the, in the upper left of the screen, a basic decomposition of this problem. I'm interested in the problem uh, when you implement the system with cameras. And so you know, a basic system to build this would capture some number of images from cameras which might support ranging, like a distance to, to objects in the field. You need to be able to do some image filtering and geometric transformation. So this is to transform the data that you've captured from the perspective of the camera to the perspective of the user or the screen. And the result of this step is some cloud of points which you can feed to a gesture recognition algorithm that looks for hands and eventually feeds that to the OS as HID input, so it can turn into you know, gesture messages or mouse messages and, and so on. Now, what, uh, what characterizes this workload is, of course, high data rates, 
if you have a lot, if you have multiple cameras producing large images at you know 60 to 100 hertz, and because we want to be able to use uh, commodity hardware, we might have noisy input. And to convince you of that, I'm showing you this uh, this blue blob in the lower right of the screen. And if you kind of squint and tilt your head to the side, you can see this is my hand in front of my screen. This is actually captured from the prototype that I've been building. Very, very noisy. So we need some, some pretty uh, heavyweight algorithms to be able to, to denoise this. Now, here's how I wish I could build this system. What I wish I could do is write four separate programs and connect them with POSIX pipes. It would be nice and modular. And the four programs would be uh, cat USB, so cat slash dev slash USB to capture images from a device. Xform, which transforms image data and does noise filtering and puts it in the perspective of, of the screen. The detect takes a point cloud, looks for hands, and then HID input takes the output of detect, sends it to the OS. Now, some observations. Capturing data from a camera, sending mouse events to an OS, these are inherently sequential. Noise filtering, geometric transformations, and potentially detection are inherently data parallel. Now, with the OS abstractions I'm illustrating here, namely pipes, I could do this on a, you know, on a, if I were going to implement this with essentially just CPUs. However, what I want to convince you is, is that I don't want to do that. In fact, I can't really do that. And what I'm showing you here is the performance in terms of frame rate for the X form step in the prototype that I've been building. And I've built it two ways. One, using fork join parallelism. And uh, I'm running, the numbers here are captured on a four CPU or four, uh, four core CMP machine. And then the blue bars are for a GPU implementation that is using a 256 core NVIDIA card. <clears throat> now, the idea here is that there's a, there's a, a difficult trade off between the, the quality of noise filtering and uh, the amount of computation that you're willing to invest in it. And the ultimate point is that for any acceptable level of quality of noise filtering, we wind up with frame rates on the CPU implementation that are below one per second. So the system winds up being unusable. And the ultimate point is that not only do we want to use the GPU, in this case we need to. John, is there a concern? I must have missed something about this graph. I don't understand why things get worse. Oh, um, OK. So we, we can dig in. Essentially, what, what I'm using Sorry. a Sorry. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> that was much more succinct than I was, <laughs> <laughs> was going to dig into the algorithm. <laughs> All right, great. So you might say to me, OK, Chris, Fine, use the, use the GPU, what's the big deal? You can still use your pipes. Why don't you just rewrite your transform and your detect program so that you know, after it's reading, reading, reading input from the pipe, you pack it up, send it to the GPU, do your, your computation there, and hey, have you heard of these new GPU, GPU, GP, GPU frameworks you can use, make it simpler to write? Now, before I convince you that this is gonna fall down, I need to give you some background on how GPUs execute a shader program. The uh, first and probably most important property is that in general, and there are exceptions like Larrabee, of course, um, which a GPU can't run an OS. And this is because it has a different instruction set. It lacks uh, important features like interrupts that, that are critical for implementing, uh, for running an operating system. Typically, GPUs have a disjoint memory space and, are not co and that memory space is not coherent with main memory, right? And so ultimately what we wind up with is a, is a situation where some process on the CPU has to orchestrate the execution on the GPU. And in the current regime, user mode ap applications have to implement this per application in a sort of ad hoc application dependent way. Right? Now, let's take a look at the way I decompose this problem from a technology stack point of view with all of this in mind. And what I want to show you is how data is going to move back and forth across the kernel boundary. I've got some cameras connected to a USB port, and I've got all my different uh, components in the, in the design up above the, the, the user boundary. And the first thing that happens is, is we capture some image data from a camera. We read it into user space. And what do we do? We write it back into kernel space to send it into a pipe. Now, the next step in the program is, uh, is this transform step. And we need to run that on a GPU. So we're going to read data out of a pipe, write it back into the kernel through all these uh, parallelization frameworks. We run, the program on the, we run the shader program on the device and then repeat the exercise in reverse to write it into the, the pipe in the next step. Now, hopefully you can all see where this is going. You don't need me to like, play it out in great detail. We wind up with this kind of tennis match of data that is going back and forth 
you know, across the user kernel boundary that we would really like to be, avoid. And in this naive design, we wind up with 12 kernel crossings and you know, six copy to and six from for, for fairly large image buffers. And hopefully I will convince you also in subsequent slides that there are performance trade-offs introduced by using these additional layers that we'd like to be able to get rid of. Now, you might say to me, OK, so you don't want to cross the user kernel boundary. What's your problem? <laughs> Why don't you just do this? So in fairness, I will admit that this is actually the design that I started with when I thought, well, this is how I want to build this. But it's, it really is kind of a non-starter because there are no high-level abstractions. This is not where you want to be able to, you don't want to be writing code here if you can avoid it. If you're Microsoft or NVIDIA, this might be tenable because you can actually get the documentation you need to write this. But if you're me and your cube at UT, this is definitely a, you know, a challenge. And, uh, but ultimately, the solution winds up being specialized, right? You lose the modularity. But even under this design, if you're willing to accept all of that, there's still a data migration problem. And to convince you of that, I'm showing you, you know, kind of the hardware view, where we have a GPU connected on a PCI Express bus, main memory, Southbridge, Northbridge, CPU. And again, regardless of how data moves across the user kernel boundary, we wind up with, with some sort of unattractive communication patterns. So when we capture data from the USB, some of the cameras, we wind up writing into main memory. To execute on the GPU, we then need to copy it across into GPU memory space after the shader runs. We copy it back. And, and the rest, of course, is left as an exercise for the reader here, right? What we wind up with is, is the data traversing a labyrinth uh, through the system. And you know, these are big buffers. They are happening you know, with a lot, uh, at high frequency. It's avoidable. And, or I believe it's avoidable. It's not avoidable yet. <laughs> but why do we want to avoid it? It wastes bandwidth. It wastes power. PCI transfers have to be coherent with memory on the CPU, so we can even cause cache pollution here. What we really want is to be able to simplify the data path. We'd like to be able to read straight out of, uh, you know, straight out of the south bridge, go straight into the GPU memory, where we can run two steps without any additional memory transfers and only move the memory, uh, you know, only move buffers at the very end to main memory when uh, we want to perform the, the final step. And, you know. The ultimate point here is that I, that I think the machine can do this, but the OS interfaces to make it possible are not there. You could, and then you lose the modularity. Yeah. But yes, absolutely. Two passes on a shader. OK, so what I'm proposing and what I've just started to, uh, to build as extensions to Linux are some new OS abstractions to address this problem. The first is a p-task stands for parallel task. And it's like a process or a thread, but it has this uh, additional stipulation that it can exist without a dedicated user mode process managing it. It has a list of mappable input and output resources that you can think of as analogous to standard in, standard out, standard error. Next abstraction is an endpoint, which is a, you know, it's a object in the, the kernel namespace that you should think of as a data source or a sync. So examples are USB bus, buffers in GPU or CPU memory, and then a channel, which allows us to connect endpoints and uh, orchestrate how data moves to, through the system. And essentially, it's an IPC analog that is similar to a pipe and uh, you know, has also these uh, properties of being able to have one-to-one, -one, one one-to-many kinds of relationships. Now, at the end of the day, I want to make it clear that I'm fundamentally proposing that we expand the system call interface to have analogs for IPC for execution of processes on a GPU, and even scheduler hints so that we can bring the GPU under the domain of the, of the OS scheduler. Now, if we revisit this problem with, uh, with these new abstractions, what we wind up with is essentially a graph. Now, to sort of hopefully very quickly talk you through this, recall that the cat USB and HID input are sequential programs, so I've left them as traditional processes. But I've introduced p tasks for the data parallel processes, the X form and the detect. I have endpoints for each of the you know, fundamental uh, sources and sinks of data in the system, so USB source, raw image input, and I'm connecting them using these, uh, these channel abstractions. Now, <clears throat> obviously, I'm not the first guy to say that a, a, a graph is a good way of thinking about concurrency. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of people who have come before me saying, saying the same thing. So why is this a better way to solve this problem? Well, first of all, we can eliminate 
unnecessary communication by uh, implementing our channels such that they avoid uh, transfers to and from main memory where they can be avoided. Hmm? This one, absolutely. This, the, this one, I not sure. Think that's possible. Yeah, I don't think it is yet either. But I'm willing to, I'm willing to say we should have it. Okay. And of course, we can eliminate unnecessary user kernel crossings and eliminate the, you know, the need to have all these dedicated user mode processes that, that orchestrate by having the arrival of new data at a particular endpoint trigger the computation on the P task it's connected to. Now, as I said, I have been, I've only just started implementing this in Linux, but I did spend a good deal of time uh, prototyping, you know, using this little camera here in Windows 7 to see, you know, is this in fact a reasonable research direction. So I want to show you a snapshot of what, I've, what I learned doing that. And again, what I'm showing you is the performance of my XForm program. And I'm comparing a simple implementation on top of CUDA against what I'll call a PTASK analog. So what, what's a PTASK analog? Obviously, I can't modify Windows 7. I can't modify the, the drivers that NVIDIA supplies. But what I could do is build a kernel mode driver that deals with the USB and maps memory that is shared with a user mode driver whose only task is to call the copy resource API from DirectX. So essentially, I'm minimizing the uh, migration across the user kernel boundary, and I'm completely minim minimizing the uh, user mode work. And in cases, even in cases where I have to migrate data back and forth to the hardware on every frame, I can see significant speed ups this way. In cases where I can eliminate um, communication from the uh, host to the device, which I consider kind of representative of this case of uh, being able to transfer straight from USB, we can see speed ups of, of up to 10%. Sorry, 10%, 10x, 10% <laughs> plus a lot more. <laughs> All right, so uh, a brief note about related work. There's obviously a lot of it and much of it done by people in this room. Helios in particular is a, you know, very much related, although because you guys were largely looking at Larrabee-like GPUs, I think it's kind of a different problem domain. Also, I think there's essentially, these are synergistic ideas, OK? Um, Graph-based programming models. Synthesis is a big in inspiration, the, uh, the I.O. model there. Dryad, stream it, you know, direct show. This looks a lot like direct show, which has been around for quite a while now. And uh, anyway, with that, I'll try to uh, wrap things up and move on. A brief word about future work. I don't want to say too much because I've just spent the last minute, last 10 minutes really talking about future work. Uh, I do think there are a lot of interesting problems still open in transactional memory. Like I, you know, I do think that that's something that we're going to want in some form or another going forward. One problem I'm very interested in is integration with, uh, with hypervisors, virtual machine monitors. I'd like to be able to expand my horizons and look a little more at distributed parallelism. I spent a lot of time in the late 90s building .com kinds of things and would like to be able to leverage some of that experience again. And finally, I think as we come to expect more and more from how we interact with our machines, we're going to need to essentially be able to parallelize more and more complex algorithms. And you, know, that's, you can sort of read this bullet as, as code for that. I think there's a lot of uh, interesting opportunities for research there. So <clears throat> oh yes, the De Rigueur selected publication slide. Please take away from this that I have broad interests. I'm published in operating systems, architecture, programming languages, and you know, I'm essentially interested in, in anything provided it's cool. So in conclusion, I do believe parallelism is, is the way forward. And it's hard. It's probably going to remain hard for quite a while. So there's going to be plenty of interesting research opportunities there. And in order to take advantage of concurrency, we really need the right abstractions. And this requires being able to do research that looks at multiple layers of the technology stack. So thanks for listening.